Okay, well, uh, thank you. Hi, Bob. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm going to lead a panel uh, discussing uh, the future of energy studies. Uh, Ernie mentioned them uh, before. Uh, this will be a little bit different from the uh, previous panels. Uh, there's only going to be one PowerPoint presentation, a very short one. Uh, I had my uh, I had my arm twisted to uh, to uh, allow it uh, because we have uh, six panelists who served on at least one of these studies. I've served on three of the studies. John Deutsch uh, initiated the program. Ernie Moniz uh, uh, was his co-chair for the first two of these studies uh, before he would escape to the uh, Department of Energy and. Uh, other people have been involved as well, including Bob, who is the uh, <laughs> co-chair of the Future of Energy Storage Study uh, and uh, served on the nuclear study, the most recent nuclear study as well. So uh, what are we talking about? Uh, there have been uh, officially, according to the MITEI website, uh, nine uh, Future of Energy Studies. Uh, actually, there have been 10. Uh, there was an update to the first one that was uh, published in uh, 2009, which, uh, John, Deutsch, uh, which Do John Deutsch led. Uh, so we can count them as 10 studies. Uh, uh, the 2009 study was, as I said, an update of the 2003 studies. Uh, and uh, I'll just make a few remarks about, about these studies. They, the, as Ernie mentioned, the first study was initiated uh, by John and by Ernie before MIT began. However, these studies were embraced by MIT after it was uh, created. And I, I think the, the first study really uh, demonstrated uh, the principles that, that MIT was organized around. Uh, the study team, a group of uh, faculty, uh, research scientists and engineers, uh, postdocs, uh, and, and students, uh, drawn from all of MIT's five schools. Uh, each of these studies had a distinguished uh, external advisory committee coming from different disciplines uh, and with different experience from industry, uh, education, research, uh, and politics. And uh, the, the, the studies uh, uh, have continued uh, now for uh, over, uh, over 20 years. Uh, the overriding theme of these studies from the very beginning has been whether and how these uh, energy sectors can contribute uh, to decarbonization in a cost-effective way. And uh, that spirit, I think, was taken up by the uh, organizers before it became nearly as popular uh, as it is today. And uh, uh, the uh, my own experience uh, has been, uh, uh, I have found these to be uh, really interesting. I learned a lot. I learned a lot about my colleagues in different departments and uh, in different schools. I learned about uh, the variance in patients that people have in uh, uh, organizing studies like this. Uh, I'd also, b before we get to the panel, uh, I'd like to just uh, thank Bob. Uh, I was, when I came back, it, from being president of the Sloan Foundation six years ago, Bob welcomed me, re-engaged me with, uh, uh, with my IT. I learned from Susan today that what we did at the Sloan Foundation was provide cat food to MIT to help to support a lot of these studies. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we uh, appreciated them. So uh, the, the panel today, as I said, uh, uh, is composed of uh, 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 faculty, research scientists, research engineers who participated in at least one of these studies. Uh, Dick liked them so much, he chaired or co-chaired two of them. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm sure uh, he'll tell us about that experience. So I'd like to start with nuclear power uh, because depending on how you count, either three of nine or four of 10 of these studies have focused on, on nuclear power. Uh, in one way or another. Uh, I'd say the first study, uh, which in 2003, which I participated in, uh, was uh, uh, somewhat uh, uh, 
concerned about whether there was a future for nuclear power. And uh, the study identified uh, a number of barriers, uh, costs, uh, the absence of any kind of a, a, a tax on carbon emissions or price on carbon emissions or premium for carbon emissions, whoops. Uh, and uh, uh, it was a little bit gloomy. The update in 2009 was even more gloomy uh, because uh, we had not uh, begun another uh, nuclear plant in the US or in Western Europe in the interim years, and many of our policy uh, recommendations were, uh, were, not, uh, were not followed. And then the most recent study, which Jacopo read, I would say was more enthusiastic and had a, mm -hmm. uh, more optimistic and had a, a set of pathways for, uh, for moving the ball forward. And I thought we'd uh, start with him, if we can get this computer to run, uh, uh, to start this off. And he has the one PowerPoint presentation to, uh, to, to get it going. But it's not a real presentation. Right. It's a couple of pictures with Bob in it. So. <laughs> Don't try to make me look bad. Um, so I actually want to start with a few remarks about Bob. Uh, the, the first time, I think, or one of the first encounters I had with him was 2007, you might not remember, but you and Ernie were kind enough to include me on a delegation of MIT faculty that went to Saudi Arabia. I think mm -hmm. the main objective was to try to convince Saudi Aramco to become uh, a member or more engaged in the, um, in the MIT Energy Initiative. And of course, the experience was very interesting, discovering a new culture. We talked a lot of science and technology. That was great. But one of the biggest takeaways was really for me to observe you and Ernie interact with um, uh, the folks over there, right? And so they gave us the um, first-class treatment. Uh, we were really welcome well. And uh, throughout all those conversations, it was pretty clear that the gravitas that MIT brings to the table, this aura of, you know, innovation and, and potential impact played a major role. And, and it, was, it was good because I think in the end they felt uh, honor that we went over there as opposed to us being honored that to be invited over there and so on. So, so just observing how you know how, how you deal with, uh, with with situations has been a great learning experience for me. Um, but let's get to the uh, you know to the to the study that I led. As already been mentioned a couple of times, there was this 2003 study, and then fast forward 13 years, there is the uh, future of nuclear power uh, number two, the revenge, so to speak. That. Uh, I, uh, I, I had the pleasure to, to, to lead. And what has happened in between these 13 years were three things, um, two bad, one good uh, for nuclear. Good, uh, of course, the growing interest um, and determination to decarbonize the energy system. I think this is a tide that has lifted all boats, all clean energy technologies, nuclear, solar, wind, carbon capture, sequestration, and all of that. Um, and the two that were bad, one was uh, shale, bad for nuclear, I would say. One was shale gas, which effectively uh, depressed uh, electricity prices and, and killed the first nuclear renaissance of which we spoke in the, in the, in the 2000s. It made actually nuclear not particularly competitive. Certainly not new nuclear, but incredibly even existing nuclear power plants for a while were not, were not really uh, competitive because of the low cost of, uh, of natural gas. And then, of course, we also had the accident in Japan, which was uh, a very, very detrimental to nuclear and set the whole industry back um, about about 10 years. So at that time, um, enough things had happened uh, that we decided collectively with Richard Lester, I think he's still in the room, who was here earlier, and a bunch of other faculty that it was time to take a fresh look at nuclear and see what the prospects would be. And so uh, this is all in the family because as Paul mentioned, at that time he was the um, uh, director of the, of the Sloan Foundation, and the Sloan Foundation was the major uh, sponsor, if you will, or, or supporting organization for the for the study, and, and the study really, uh, if I were to dumb it down into uh, you know one one slide, which we're not going to show, <laughs> evidently, um, really says four things, four four messages. First, um, it is useful to have nuclear in the energy mix if you're trying to decarbonize and trying to maintain cost within a reasonable band, and that is because. Um, having something that looks like nuclear, which is dispatchable essentially, or always on, or anyway, energy on demand, uh, and low carbon, uh, prevents you from having to overbuild monstrously the capacity of um, other clean energy technologies such as solar, uh, wind, and storage. You still need all of that. And the, you know, we were, I think, one of the first projects that used the Gen X code 
uh, one of the first major projects is the GenX code here at MIT. And so we look at different power markets. It was pretty clear that if you have a little bit of nuclear, you can achieve your decarbonization targets at an overall lower cost. That was the first message. The second message, though, was the recognition that nuclear does have a cost uh, problem. This is not <laughs> universal. It's not global. Uh, there are countries like uh, South Korea, China, um, India, even Russia to an extent that have been able to deploy nuclear power plants at reasonable cost um, and almost invariably on time. But in the West, loosely defined as the United States and Western Europe, that has not been the experience over the past 20, uh, 20, 30 years. In fact, for a long time, we didn't even build nuclear power plants. And then when we started to, or when the industry started to rebuild um, uh, a decade ago, it didn't go particularly well. And so in the study, we spent a lot of time trying to understand the reasons. And we found that it had nothing really to do with the technology per se. There is nothing particularly difficult about uh, you know, uh, producing nuclear fuel or, or, or making nuclear components. But it has a lot to do with uh, managing these very large construction projects. You know, thousands of people at sprawling construction sites with a complex supply chain with a fairly uh, cumbersome uh, uh, licensing uh, licensing process and all of that. And so, the um, uh, the the third message, uh, you know, after this realization is that there are ways to reduce this cost, and some has to do with uh, implementing really best project management practices, which is routinely done in other countries, but in the U.S., not really for a nuclear project, but also for other big infrastructure projects. Um, we also, of course, had some um, uh, suggestions, uh, which was the fun, uh, how to reduce costs also through technologies. And interestingly, contrary to my expectation, we did not endorse or find that a particular reactor design or reactor type would be uh, the key to reducing costs, uh, but more... Um, cross-cutting technologies that would attack the indirect costs, the cost, for example, civil structures or, or engineering and licensing and things of that type. So for a, a couple of examples, and then I'm coming to an end here, um, seismic isolation allows for a standardization of the superstructure, the nuclear island, as we call it, uh, so that you don't have to basically effectively relicense a nuclear power plant for an individual site. It's sort of one size fits all. Or uh, advanced concrete solutions that allow to reduce the cost, labor, and time associated with erecting reinforced concrete structures, and that's a big, big part of what uh, advanced, uh, or what uh, excuse me, a new nuclear power plant construction costs are about. Uh, and then another one, which is everybody's favorite, of course, is modular construction. So instead of bringing raw materials and components to the site and then assembling the plant at the site, prefabricate large modules and then ship those large modules to the site and connecting them a little bit more like Lego style. All of those, the jury is still out whether it will actually pan out and there will be significant uh, construction cost reductions. But those were part of the recommendations. And then the last point, the fourth message is is shown there at the bottom. None of this can happen, like for all these clean energy technologies, uh, unless there is a significant role of the government. And you, you pro I'm sure you're all familiar with the uh, uh, latest action by mm -hmm. the government, which was the Inflation Reduction Act that really created a lot of support for all clean energy technologies, including nuclear. So with that, if we move to the next and final slide. Mm -hmm. So uh, happy retirement, Bob. Um, you know, we'll miss you, but at the same time, I take great consolation in knowing that in typical MIT style, you won't really retire. You know that, of course. Uh, it just means you won't teach. You might not be as active in Mighty, but, uh, you know, you'll, you'll hang out because uh, I'm sure you can't do without it, uh, without us, and we can't do without you. So, But it has been really a huge honor and, and pleasure to, uh, to work with you over the years. And so, again, um, uh, wonderful to, to, to have met you and uh, now looking forward to celebrating you uh, later tonight as well. So, yeah. And we'll just leave that slide up while we <laughs> the rest of the talk. Uh, I'm sorry for the interruption. Microsoft decided to do three upgrades while we were <laughs> while we're standing here. Uh, Jacqueline, let me just ask you uh, one question. I, I remember very well when the Sloan Foundation funded or started to fund your study. Uh, at that time, there was a lot of talk about existing nuclear plants closing down. Uh, and it was, of, I think, of, of great concern to people who were worried about uh, CO2 production and a concern that 
would there be more coal and natural gas generation and producing more CO2? So is that behind us now as a result of the Inflation Reduction Act? I, I think overall it is behind us. However, since uh, we met back in 2016, a few more have shut down, and invariably in those states, the emissions have gone up. I think now there is a much greater awareness of the environmental and economic uh, value as well as you know great reliability value of those assets. So I think I think those days are over. Um, the uh, only uh, nuclear power plant in the United States, which at the moment is uh, still nominal on the chopping blocks, the two units at Diablo Canyon, although in a spectacular reversal of fortunes, even that plant now uh, seems to be heading for uh, a 20-year license extension. So if it can happen in California, it can probably happen anyway. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, let's turn now to the uh, future of solar energy, sort of at the renewable end of the spectrum. Uh, Grid-based solar energy has been expanding rapidly uh, with projects now in long queues for interconnection to the grid, uh, uh, replacing fossil generation. Uh, let me just turn this to, to Vladimir. Did, did you see this coming when you did this <laughs> study? One of, one, of, one of the things about writing a future of something study, sometime later someone asks, well, did you get it right or wrong? And uh, did you see this coming? Uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> Why are you yes, here then? Yes, and, and I was inspired throughout by my colleague Dick Schmalensee, who is the director of the study. I'm, I'm just a co-director of the study. <laughs> so, the, uh, no, it was actually an incredible experience. I do have to tell you that solar is on the rise, clearly, and uh, it will change the world. And many of the things we have foreseen in the study uh, actually came to be. We didn't quite know back then how to do them, but yeah. we could say things like, if you can make something as efficient as silicon, but make it on a newspaper printing machine using even cheaper materials over larger areas, that could be transformational as long as you can keep the efficiency. Now, all this seemed like a pipe dream back when we were writing it. However, there is not, no reason why it shouldn't be able to be done. It's just we didn't have the right material right there and then until maybe eight years ago, when perovskite materials came on the scene, uh, when organic uh, materials became much more efficient. And actually today you can do things like you can never imagine doing before. Um, now, I'm gonna say a few extra words, Dick, uh, but I have to emphasize that everything that I'm about to say was produced by many of our colleagues, again, led by Dick and very much admired by me. Imagine a young faculty like myself having a chance to participate in the, um, not energy initiative, but energy research initiative, was it? Uh, that we were imagining before the energy initiative ever, ever became. And being tapped by uh, brains like Bob, like Ernie, having a chance to run into John continuously. Um, and these are my first days in MIT. <laughs> Just think of uh, where someone like that, exposed to those kinds of giants, can actually lead. Um, I found myself extremely inspired throughout. Uh, and indeed, when Energy Initiative was launched, I participated in the Energy Education Task Force, and then following that, again, was extremely lucky to be introduced to Dick and to think through how do we actually make solar technology something different than before. And what that led us to do, and what the fruits of Energy Initiative are, are not just these reports, which I think are the main element of what Energy Initiative gives to the world, beyond all that great research, uh, but also actually ways to make technology real. Uh, we don't just stick with the idea of forming a good written paper, but uh, you make things like this. Uh, this is a this is a testing kit for brilliance. And Bob, do you mind stepping up for just a moment? Um, all it requires is a magic wand and a really smart guy. Um, and just, it's on, it's on, the magic wand is on. Yeah, all you do is just uh, project it. And if we can, ah, yeah, there we're catching the brain <laughs> uh, And we are indeed powering the electrical motors. That's uh, not solar, that's the brilliance motor. Um, <laughs> okay, Bob, well, it is actually solar. <laughs> and this is an infrared light bulb uh, made by, uh, you know, someone else, but this is a solar cell made by MIT students uh, that led to rethinking of what solar surface can be. Or what we imagined back in the day printing on those newspaper printing presses, solar cells, you can actually now do that. Uh, so you can take a piece of plastic and coat it with organic semiconductors and make a solar cell. 
It's about 10 times less weight than silicon, and you can bend it and not crack it. But that's not a cool one. Uh, the cool one would be this one. This was just published last year. This is 120 times less weight than silicon. Half as much power for Unitaria. But OK, you know, when it comes to, uh, <laughs> I only had a year to make this silicon head 40, but not, not that. What's much more important is if you want to deploy this in a village that has no power, they need to carry a chunk of these on their back or one of the panels on the back. How much more power will you carry for 25 kilos? Well, 25 kilos of this will give you 60 times more power. Opportunities are vast, and we reimagined them when we were writing the actual report. We didn't know how to do it, but now we are beginning to be able to do it. So I'd say we are coming up with ways of rethinking solar energy. Uh, and I think with these kinds of deployments, ubiquity of solar will be different from what we've seen it today. I often say that the silicon of today, the solar panels as we know them, they're like vacuum tubes compared to the transistors we are about to adapt. But the initiation of the image of what those transistors would look like was indeed in those very meticulous ways of studying. It took us a number of years to put out the solar study. But I'm so happy that it took so long as we were able to rethink over and over again what are the main driving parameters. My job now, by the way, is to run uh, MIT Nano. And so, of course, the answer is always on the nanoscale. So I know this might not be the right moment, but since I'm speaking anyhow, I don't to interrupt afterwards. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, leave off with just a couple of gardening gifts, because um, I'm sure that's the next thing you intend to do. So this one is to remind you that nanoscale rules. Uh, and indeed, uh, solar systems like this are only enabled by nanoscale. I can link you to your imagination what 10 to the minus 9 might stand for. Uh, Bob, thank you. Uh, and secondly, um, if anyone comes by your home and doesn't know the Boston vernacular on how to properly pronounce nanometer, it's a nanometer, and they're wicked small. Uh, so this is your second issue to enjoy while your gardening experience goes. But thank you so much for doing everything you have for me. I <laughs> love engineers. They always bring stuff with them. Although I'm, I'm really glad you didn't bring a nuclear power plant with you. <laughs> uh, let, let, me, let me turn this uh, discussion of solar over to Dick. Dick and I go back a long way. We first worked together, uh, aside from teaching in the economics department, actually in the energy laboratory, right. uh, which preceded this. And we were both the directors of the MIT Center for Energy and Environmental Policy research after that. So, you know, we've been around for a while, but yeah. Dick, I, one of the things I was struck by in the future of solar study and then the, and then the, uh, the follow on a future of energy storage is how much the costs of solar have gone down. It used to be people would say, well, how much is it gonna cost us to switch to renewables and so on? Mm -hmm. Did you see this when you did the future of solar study? No. First of all, you're making me follow Vladimir. <laughs> Don't you have That's stuff? That's not fair. <laughs> Look, John Deutsch pulled me into the solar study. Uh, I don't remember what line he used, but at that time, uh, solar was way out of the money, just way out of the money. And we looked at it as, you know, maybe something would happen. Well, as the study, <laughs> as Vladimir pointed out, took a little while, <laughs> uh, things changed dramatically. And solar went from an interesting curiosity up there in satellites to a, a, a potentially and then actually important grid scale power source. Um, and we didn't see that, I must say. We appreciated it, it happened. What we focused on, uh, and again, this is the engineers, not me, was, well, what's next, as Vladimir pointed out. And our policy recommendation was, you don't want to make crystalline silicon, silica, silicon a little bit better. You want to look at all these new things. And that's where we said R&D should go. Now, I don't know how the federal government has allocated R&D, but obviously a lot of stuff at MIT has gone in that direction. Uh, and, and I will say, consistent with other studies, so that recommendation sort of worked. We always make, because economists infect these studies, <clears throat> we always make uh, uh, 
recommendations designed to improve resource allocation. And in the solar study, we spent a little time talking about how the way we support solar should be changed. No one listened to a word of that. <laughs> we, we were right, we are right. Uh, uh, there's a little bit of a walk away from uh, the way we had been supporting residential rooftop, but not much and not everywhere. And it's, it's still a mess. And we said so. But, you know, you win some, you lose some. Uh, every quarter, my trustees at the Sloan Foundation would ask you, whatever happened to that MIT future of solar energy study? Uh, but it came out. It did take sufficiently long that we went all the way down the learning curve to <laughs> where solar became quite economical. Well, we learned uh, but, a lot over the years. Yes, I will say great. that. Yeah, that was fun to do. Well, that's an important feature of these studies is we all learn a lot from them. And... Uh, uh, it's not just uh, for show. Let me turn now to, to materials, to resources. In, in, uh, in the solar study and, and especially in the storage study, uh, where, things are ex where supplies are expanding very, very rapidly in, in a relatively small period of time, it always came up, was there going to be enough lithium? Was there going to be enough zinc? Was there going to be enough cobalt? And recently, I've been reading, uh, uh, with regard to nuclear power, all kinds of concerns about, uh, is there going to be enough, uh, en enough uh, resources to concentrate uranium uh, for, for, uh, uh, for enrichment, for fuel fabrication? And Elsa, maybe I'd just call on you to, how do we think about this? What do we <laughs> conclude in the future of energy storage study? Is there going to be enough to, to support this uh, huge rollout? Thank you so much, Paul. It's such an honor to be here. And thank you so much, Bob, for bringing me into all these discussions. I've learned so much. And any panel that lets me hear Vladimir's Boston accent is definitely a win. Uh, so that's one for the books. Um, so I think that exactly the point you made, uh, Paul, you know, it's what we find consistently when we're looking at of the ability of material supply chains to meet the sorts of future of needs that we're talking about here. It's not about are we running out, it's about the rate at which we need to be having these uh, supply chains build up and deploy and you know, not just on the extraction side, the, the resource side as you talked about, but also the refining capacity, how we think about recycling. Um, and I think that the, the ways in which thinking about materials in the context of any of these technologies lets us think about it across the value chain is one of the real convening opportunities that Mighty has. And we definitely saw that in the, in the materials aspects of the uh, future of storage study that I had the opportunity to work with. And in that future of store, in the materials aspect of the future of report, I had the opportunity to work with Bob Jaffe, who was, which was another honor. Um, and he had <coughs> sort of thought through the kinds of architectures to think about supply chains in the context of the future of solar study. And he leveraged the work of, of Jessica Transic, who's also here in the audience. And so I think the ways in which these studies across your bulleted list, not even just that nuclear appeared mm -hmm. there so many times, but you know the, the kinds of constructs that, that Bob Jaffe had thought about in pursuing the future of solar storage and how to think about material supply chains, excuse me, in solar, um, you know, we, we got a chance to relive and rethink about in the context of future of storage. And that's relevant not only in the way that we talk about the results, you know, from the future of studies, but also in what that means for the material supply chains. Um, I think what we particularly learned in, in storage, uh, again, not about running out, but can we meet the rate? Um, one of the findings of the, in particularly that was notable, and for me an important learning in the work we've gone forward, it was around nickel. And so nickel's historic compound annual growth rate, it, it was much lower than what would be needed, particularly as we start to shift away from cobalt chemistries. Um, and that was a really important finding that's led us to subsequent work that I have with, with Rob Stoner now, and I saw Chris Knittel in the audience, so also the ways in which the, the opportunities that we have to, to convene and work with our colleagues um, to, to be able to think about the aspects that we can have an impact at, at, in, um, at MIT in these areas. And I think that's been particularly important given the whack-a-mole nature of, of materials, as you're saying, are we running out of this, are we running out of that, where's this coming from? And I think the questions that we're able to really build analytical capacity towards that then inform some of the technologies we're going after um, are really critical in, in, in given that rate that I said, sort of how quickly are we going to be able to build out these supply chains, 
and what does that mean for what sorts of things we're gonna lock in? And I think that's an important opportunity or important challenge that's been highlighted in the work we've done in, in Nickel um, so far, is that you know, given the different routes that we're gonna be taking in terms of extraction and refining, the fact that we need to do it quickly, is that gonna mean certain things for the environmental implications of that? And I think that we're particularly seeing that now in the, in the sorts of coverage in Indonesia um, in, in, in building out Nickel supply chains. Um, and then, so, that's, that's an answer to your question. I think the other really important thing that the Future of Studies gave me an opportunity or the Future of, of Storage uh, gave me an opportunity is to see our, not only spend time with our colleagues, but work with our colleagues to disseminate the sorts of learnings from these and presenting in the various forum that, that uh, Bob led and that Mighty enabled to talk about what we learn in the, in the um, academies or to OSTP and hearing the ways in which our colleagues translate their work um, into dissemination, I think, is another really important way in which these the the opportunity kind of lives beyond the the way we're talking about it right now. Let, let, let me just add something to that uh, excellent point. Most of the future of energy storage project was done during the COVID era, <coughs> during the time when MIT was closed for most of us. Uh, there was the re-entry re to MIT during this period of time, and somehow we managed to continue to work on this uh, using Zoom, using trading uh, uh, memos and papers back and forth, and uh, the, the faculty and the research scientists and graduate students and postdocs were really uh, adapted very, very quickly to uh, being able to continue to work uh, during this environment. Uh, let me turn now to coal, the future of coal study. I, I've always thought that study was misnamed. I think it should have been the, the future of carbon capture and storage from, uh, from coal, because that was really very much the, the focus of the study. Uh, you know, it was another study, I think, where uh, uh, it was kind of hard to predict the future. At that time when we started it, coal was cheap. It looked like we'd keep burning it to, uh, to generate electricity. Uh, and if we were going to keep doing that, how are we going to decarbonize the electricity sector? Uh, if you look today, when, when in 2007, when this study was published, 50% of the electricity produced in the U.S. was generated with coal. Uh, today, it's less than 20%. Uh, yet we haven't deployed much carbon capture and storage in, <laughs> uh, in that sector during this period of time. And I thought that uh, Howie, uh, who's gone from optimist to pessimist, and I think optimist maybe again, could tell us what, what has happened to carbon capture and storage? And is it, 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 is it something that's moving along and can help to get us to, uh, to a point where we can back out uh, coal and maybe natural gas in the future, economically? Okay. <clears throat> well, let, I will answer the question, but maybe in a little roundabout way. Let me start, uh, I, I wanna read, well, first of all, here's the report. <laughs> <laughs> and and Paul is absolutely right. If you look at the report, there's a real heavy focus on uh, carbon capture and storage. But I, I wanna read uh, uh, one thing from here and show you how it's really hard to predict the future. So the first thing it says, our premise, One, there were two premises, our first premise is that the risks of global warming are real and that the United States and other governments should and will take action to restrict the emissions of CO2 and other greenhouse gases. I think the problem with that statement is, and will. I, I don't think <laughs> yeah. we've gone nearly far enough. And I, I will say, if you look here at the cover page, it says, options for a carbon-constrained world. And I would argue we do not live in a carbon-constrained world today. So saying all of that, I think what we say technically about carbon capture and storage is um, absolutely true, uh, but uh, the implementation has slowed down. And I'll give some specific examples in a minute, but we also go on to say our second and equally important premise is that coal will continue to play a large and indispensable role in a greenhouse gas constrained world. Now, that means we sort of missed the shale uh, gas thing, uh, just as uh, Jacopo said about uh, the nuclear study. Well, we did and we didn't. As Paul said, and I have, I looked up the numbers from 2007 when this report came out to 2022, 
the use of coal in the United States has decreased by 57%. But despite that, if we look at world numbers, despite the decrease of the US and Western Europe, the use of coal in the world has gone up 16%. So there's still a need uh, there, but this is now we're looking at mostly in Asia. And to our credit, we had specific chapters in this report on both China and India, which are two of the biggest coal users and the growing sectors of coal now um, in, in the world. Um, what's happened with carbon capture and storage is back in 2007, uh, the funding in the US came out of the Department of Energy through the coal, the coal department. So carbon capture and storage and coal were almost synonymous. When people said clean coal, they, they talked about carbon capture and storage. Um, what went on through the years um, as we went on, uh, and coal especially decreased uh, importance here, carbon capture and storage started being looking at other fields. And today, uh, the three big areas that people are looking at are one, hydrogen production, uh, uh, what they call blue hydrogen. Two is an industry, uh, cement's always uh, one that's named, but there can be others. Uh, iron and steel is also named, even though we did some work in iron and steel recently, and it looks like it may not be as good there as, say, cement. And third, people now talk about capturing CO2 from the air, whether it's with bioenergy and carbon capture or direct air capture. Um, I've written a lot on direct air capture, and it's, let's just say it's quite expensive. <laughs> um, and yeah, my point is, if we're having a hard time making the economics work from point sources, why should we dilute the uh, stream a factor of 300 and think it's going to be any cheaper to grab it out of the air. Um, but uh, so having said that, one thing we call for in the report is large scale demonstrations. And uh, in two, I think it was 2008, maybe 2009, in the stimulus bill in the US, a lot of money was poured into demonstrations. We had several projects built, one in the front for coal, the Petronova plant here in the US. Also in Canada, they built uh, one for coal at uh, Boundary Dam, and that's still running. Uh, uh, the Petronova's carbon capture was shut down for financial reasons, but it's been bought by a Japanese company, and there's talk of restarting uh, uh, that up today. And in terms of demonstrations within, uh, with both the um, Inflation Reduction Act as well as the uh, infrastructure bill, uh, there's a lot of money pouring in on the order of $10 billion. And so we're going to see a lot uh, of activity. If I look forward into the future, I sort of say this is giving the U.S. a sugar high. So we're getting a lot of money in, a lot of activity. But once that money disappears, what's the long-range policy that's going to drive this? And we're not there yet. So I'm optimistic in the short run we have an opportunity but unless we get some real policy that drives us to a carbon constrained world, uh, CCS is gonna have a problem, nuclear is gonna have a problem, uh, as well as a lot uh, of other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I would say in both the first nuclear study and in the future of coal study, I think we really did introduce the notion of, in one way or another, putting a price on carbon emissions and, and examined how that would change uh, the economics and potentially the outcomes going forward. And I think at that point, anyway, it was a, an innovation to think of things in that way. Uh, let me turn now to another question. Uh, in, in the future of storage study and also in the uh, future of nuclear study in a carbon-constrained world, which uh, Jacopo co-chaired, uh, the, we relied on, in part, on uh, energy, on systems models, on modeling, optimization, uh, looking at the economics of different technologies, not in isolation, but uh, combined. And uh, I, I'd just like to ask, I'd start with Derek, uh, uh, how important do you think this is in, in uh, introducing this kind of modeling uh, uh, into our into our policy studies like this? And actually, I think in Jacobo, I think you used three different models, is my recollection. Well, it was uh, Gen X, I thought. It was Gen X yeah, mostly. Gen X. But we, we used the same we model in, the solar and, and, and in the solar study. So what do you think? Should we be moving <laughs> forward? Important? And I should say, Gen X, is a, Gen, <laughs> X is a, Gen X is a model <laughs> developed here. It's open source. I think it's something we, 
we insisted on. Open source does not mean you just open the box and it works, but it's, <laughs> it's open source. It, I think it, we recently had it, it only took an undergraduate a month to get it to work, which is not so bad. Derek? So, so I'd, I'd like to just start by saying this is a very esteemed panel to be on, and you know, I'm, I'm coming in much, with much fewer you know, experiences uh, to <laughs> share, but I'll, I'll just share the one experience that you know, I, came, I came to academia from after being disillusioned, spending a few years in industry, so no offense to anybody <laughs> in the audience who's from industry. But uh, when I did come here, I was a pretty lonely postdoc trying to walk the halls of Mighty to figure out what I wanted to do next, and I ran into Bob, and he, he saw the confidence that I could basically pull off being in the hard seat between economists and engineers on, on either side to actually run, to run these models with the right set of parameters that will keep both parties happy. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so I, I'm really grateful for, for that opportunity. And you know, it has, it has kind of opened my aperture to a, you know, what the value of models like these could be. I wasn't necessarily a systems modeler before I came to MIT. I've learned a lot uh, working uh, to understand what these models can and cannot do. Um, so I certainly see a lot of value for them, and I'm hoping to build an academic career around this. So, uh, but I, I, you know, I, I think uh, at least in the energy storage study, it was particularly important given that storage is not a generator, storage is not transmission, uh, storage is not demand, and you really have to think about storage as a sort of a piece of a jigsaw puzzle that's linking up with everything else. And uh, so I thought, uh, you know, it was a it was a great experience despite you know the virtual world we lived in, um, communicating. Uh, you know, what the model does, the model has its advantages that it can analyze many different possibilities, but it's also extremely hard to communicate because it appears like a black box to people who can't see inside the model or, or don't know its limitations. Um, so it was, it was a really great learning experience working with Dick, Paul, um, you know, the, the technical team, as well as Bob, uh, to understand, uh, you know, how we set up these models, what kind of uh, scenarios we want to consider, and more importantly, when it came time to actually writing the the 400 page report, trying to write a report that was internally consistent uh, across the chapters and do it, doing so in a way that is you know, approachable for you know, somebody who's not sort of technically versed in metal air batteries or you know, redox flow batteries, but also then connected to the economics of these technologies. So um, you know, I, I've learned a lot. I think we have, we have asked more questions in the report at the end. Um, if anybody got to the end, <laughs> um, then you know that sort of lays out you know an excellent you know research career if one wants to set it up um, in in this area. And I think uh, you know I, I, the whole Inflation Reduction Act is just a prime example of how a lot of the policy sausage making that happened was actually informed by policy. And it's a it's a perfect case in a point about you know having the ability of these models to be able to inform uh, directions. They, you know not everybody will agree with the approaches, but I think if you're trying to do something. Uh, you need these systems model to, to see the big picture. So, Jake, do you want to add anything? I think these are kind of, these models are kind of natural to economists, but well, well they sure do. Something. But you know, they're big linear programming models, right. and, and and we sort of understand that. But I was going to say one of the great pleasures in this whole process was infecting Derek with economics. <laughs> right? I mean, he's published with us in economics yeah. journals now, yeah. and I don't know if he can live that down. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it, there is a common language when you think about optimization and shadow prices and all of this good stuff that, that uh, is common across many disciplines, not all, but many disciplines. Uh, so the, the communication in these studies is possible. It is never effortless across disciplines, but it is possible and interesting and interesting. Elsa, how did you find just receiving information in this way? Was it helpful? Was it confusing? Did you... Start start reading your email. What was the <laughs> <laughs> what information? Sorry, Paul, I missed the question. The, the model the, the modeling exercises we did were they informative to your work as well? Oh sure, yeah, no, and I think you know we we look at similar things um, in what we're doing. I was going to build off of the point that Derek made around kind of informing IRA. I think we just um, did some work for NSF's uh, Technology Innovation Partnership Group and OSTP around helping to think about the value of analytics in policy. And I think that there's an increasing awareness you know, to, to Howie's point of, because we need the policies to happen in order for these things to, to go beyond the, the sugar high, which I like as a construct. Um, and, and that needs to be done through deep uh, systems analysts perspective. So I talked about kind of systems from the physical, like building the value chain, but this is the, the sort of necessary complement to it, for sure. I think we always have to make sure the models don't become completely dissociated from reality. So I remember two questions that 
came up when we were doing this. So this model insisted on building onshore wind yeah. in the Northeast, a lot of it. And, but, but everyone was building offshore wind. And uh, we went back and forth. We narrowed the areas where you could build it until you could kind of only build it in Maine. It still wanted to build onshore wind and not offshore wind. And now they're breaching all the offshore wind contracts <laughs> because they're too expensive. And I'm, uh, I'm wondering whether uh, we were right or not. <laughs> but we also yeah. learned, we also talked to somebody in, in the industry. Right, right. I mean, that's kind of a, a thing economists don't do, but, but we did it. <laughs> and he said, but you can't assemble an adequate parcel right. in New England, an adequate sized parcel. So yeah, if you could get the land at sort of the nominal value, you, it would be great, but you can't, so we quit. And then I remember the other thing, we, we actually analyzed nuclear power in the Southwest, both the existing units and new units, and the model wouldn't build- South, Southeast. Southeast, yeah. the model wouldn't build new plants. And uh, whereas Jacobo used the same model and they built new <laughs> nuclear plants. And uh, my what recollection is it turned out we were using different cost assumptions. Yeah. Uh, and if we yeah. put in your costs into our model, we, we got very, very similar results. Yeah, yeah I think it's, it's, a, it's a telling example of how, um, I think since the time when the nuclear study was released, if I recall, it was 2018, and you know when we released it, and when we actually did our modeling, which is 2021, solar became cheaper in the US and nuclear became more expensive. So yeah, the, you yeah, know, the, yeah. the kind of the equation flipped on its head. So it was just, you know, um, you know, these models have a very, sh the, the outcomes of these models have a very short shelf life. So uh, look into the footnotes as a sort of a, a person who's been on the other side of these models. It, it's really important. I mean, we learned in the course of these studies how important it is to be transparent about your assumptions. Right. Uh, it's so easy to just write it up and say, blah, 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 really quick. And here's the, here's the answer. And these models should not be treated that way <laughs> because in most cases, they're very sensitive to controversial assumptions. So, so let me turn, I'm gonna let, let each of you comment on, yeah, do you want a question or a comment? I have a question. Sure. I live in Canada, in Ontario, and the government recently announced that we overinvested in solar and wind, so we have an oversupply of power now that we hadn't planned on, and we're going to cut our heat rate by two. It will go down from 8.2 cents to 4.7 cents. Canadian. <laughs> so has this happened in any of the in, in any of the states as well? Has has alternative energy been so successful yeah. that uh, you have an oversupply of power? Yes. Yeah, so. I don't know if it's an oversupply, but prices in the middle of the day oh, yeah. in places like California, which has very abundant solar has come into the market, are very, very low, whereas you always think of the peak price as being very high. Well, that's still the peak demand period. You wouldn't know it is because there's so much rooftop PV that doesn't show up in the demand on the system and so much... Uh, uh, grid-based PV on the system that you get negative prices uh, sometimes during the day, and it's raised a whole set of questions about what the right pricing structure should be. And actually, we 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 ended up we writing a couple on. of papers. If, if on we could build a high-capacity transmission line to Canada, we could solve the problem of excess power. <laughs> Although I didn't know the sun shined in Canada, but that's a, yeah. a, whole, other, <laughs> a whole other thing. Uh, let me ask a question. Any of you can chime in on. It's really an organizational question. Uh, the studies of have relied heavily on busy faculty and research scientists, kind of volunteers, many of them working for free. And they're very busy, they're from different disciplines, uh, they have lots of demands on their time. And is, is this a, a, a good way of uh, uh, organizing these kinds of studies going forward? I mean, when I, when I was involved in the first study, I knew that John Deutsch would yell at me if I didn't do what I was told. And we can't always depend on John Deutsch yelling at us. And I'm, I'm just, if you've given any thought to this. I I'll think go around the table. Susan mentioned uh, uh, a characteristic of the MIT culture, that there's a feeling that we're sort of obliged to help work on the world's problems. And I think that that aspect of the culture enables the, uh, th these studies to attract people. I'm not sure how sustainable that is, and I certainly don't think it generalizes to many other institutions. 
Um, you know, we all have other things we could do, and much as much as I've enjoyed learning things, going through the fourth draft of Chapter Seven, <laughs> sort of thing, is, and wondering why those engineers can't write it in English. Uh, it, it's you know that's that that has a certain charm, but but uh, but I I do think it it comes it comes from the culture. We sort of think this is important stuff, and we we should be working on it if we can help. I'll see. Well, I also rely on John Deutsch yelling at me, so I don't know about <laughs> any other solutions. But I think that the, part of the ways in which we can kind of systematize the the engagement process and you know have the the handling of draft four be helped by you know a variety of folks. I think that I mean we experienced that in the future of storage, the way it was supported. Um, so I don't think I have any any revolutionary ideas, um, uh, you know, that that are different than than what Chris has said. Derek, I know you had lots of things on your plate when this was going forward, and at least two of us beating on you all the time. So had, had, did it work for you? I, I, th I think, you know, despite the, the, the apparent chaos, it, it, it I think worked from, for me personally because I was looking to sort of just absorb. Um, and when you're, when you're at that stage, when you're just like a sponge, you know, anybody's time is, you know, very valuable. I think the one thing that perhaps, you know, in hindsight we can, we can do better is around having the... The, the student and the researcher cohort that's actually doing a lot of the work uh, feel a little bit more integrated, maybe, you know, call them named fellows or something like that, give mm -hmm. them the, you know, the brand value that, you know, that the study truly deserves because it is interdisciplinary and um, having not been part of any of the other studies, but having read them externally, um, it is an impressive piece of work and to be part of and to see how the sausage is made. So I think a lot of the students will, will keep that in mind going forward. Vladimir? Um, the hardest thing, of course, is working with the economists, but <laughs> it's also the absolute pleasure. Uh, I, I wouldn't change the thing. Uh, I think the final product makes you feel really good because it's done. And I think the process <laughs> is extremely painful. Um, but I would say what really helped in the process, to me at least, was having students who really wanted to uh, participate in ways that I didn't anticipate. What really was inspiring to me was listening to topics I knew nothing about, and I right. really I should have. Um, if I'm really thinking properly about solar. Uh, and yes, what, as faculty, we have very narrow focus. Uh, when else do we have a chance to be in a room for numbers of hours, week after week, with our colleagues, except if you're stuck somewhere in Asia and we have nothing else to do but to listen to our <laughs> colleagues give talks, right? Uh, and that's well, a bar. this was on-campus experience of that, and I found it extremely fulfilling. Despite the fact, yes, there were definitely low moments <laughs> where I'm like, really? Uh, but nevertheless, the final product, I'm extremely proud of, of what came out of it. So I wouldn't change a thing. Yeah, well, I also enjoyed it immensely. The process was a little bit chaotic. We were, however, very fortunate to hire a, uh, an experienced and very knowledgeable a research scientist from uh, a national lab, which helped us sort of uh, keep the team together and make sure that we were meeting milestones and finishing analysis and, and, and all of that. We also got some great um, input from John, but I don't remember that he was yelling at us at any point. Um, so I, I would do it again. Um, I, I personally put in a, 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 a lot of time, primarily because I was very interested in the topic. And also, as Vladimir said, the uh, um, heterogeneity of the group was great. It was great value in you know, working with, with John Parsons and others. Uh, across the across the institute, Jessica as well uh, was was uh, a learning experience for me as well. And Howie, yeah, <clears throat> from my personal point, the, the report really lined up well with my uh, research in, interest. I, I looked at the students involved, and seven of my students were involved in the re, in the report. So um, to me, it was like this part of my overall research, and it, you know, it was fun. And uh, in, in terms of uh, John, I remember a couple of things. Remember one of my students, when we're talking about options analysis, him and John really getting into it uh, there. And I think that was a good learning experience for uh, my student uh, going head to head with John. And I don't remember John yelling at me, but I do remember him yelling at Ernie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, I was just gonna add one more thing, which is I, I think we all highlighted this, but I wanna re say it one more time. I've never had the chance to be in a room with colleagues outside my department as heterogeneously as my team enabled me to be. Uh, and is it on the committee for energy education? Is it on the studies? Is it by listening to conferences? I find that to be like no other place in the universe. I mean, what you have built to making my team become my team, uh, 
you have enabled us to grow beyond the bounds of what I ever thought my academic career would allow me mm -hmm. to do. And for that, uh, John, Ernie, Bob, thank you tremendously. And everyone else, but three of you were my uh, you know, role models to follow. As a young faculty, I had found myself extremely inspired by. It. So thank you. I would add to that that there are opportunities to be in, in rooms with colleagues from across campus doing administrative things. This is, this is more fun. <laughs> you know, I, uh, let me just add to that. I, mean, I found the studies I was involved with very interesting, but not just because I was with people with different expertise, but you learned a lot about MIT. Yeah. Because we support graduate students in different ways, we, our yeah. careers are made in different ways, we publish papers in different ways. Uh, in different places. We use postdocs and research scientists in different ways. And it just really gives you a view of the, uh, of the institution that I think you can't possibly have if you're just stuck in your department. And, uh, you know, I hope all of us will encourage our younger colleagues uh, to get involved, not necessarily in a future of energy study, but in other opportunities at MIT to work with people from other departments and, and other schools, because I, th I think you just learn a whole lot of, about the educational and research process uh, by doing that. With that, thank you all very, very much for taking the time. And thank you all. And Bob, thank you so much for supporting this endeavor. <laughs>